Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed being able to see who we have represented here today uh, on the employer booths. I am delighted now to welcome Louis Howells, headline sponsor of today from Clyde & Co, who's going to share a presentation with you. Uh, so Lewis, over to you. Thank you, and bear with me, everyone. There we go. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lewis Howells, and I'm an associate at a loan firm called Clyde & Co, as you just heard, doing insurance coverage. Don't worry, I'm not here to talk to you today about law or insurance per se. Uh, I'm here instead as per the slide to talk to you about being your authentic self at work. Uh, so if I just click on. Uh, so for the agenda for today, I'm just going to talk a bit about my background. Then I'm going to move on to discussing what being your authentic self means, uh, what some of the benefits of being authentic in the workplace are, and why I personally felt I should be authentic in the workplace what people think some of the negatives to being yourself in the workplace are and challenging those based off my own experience. And then we'll end with a bit of a Q&A section so that you get a chance to ask me any questions you have. Um, yep, yeah. and I think you should be able to do that um, on the platform. You can type in some questions and then Chris will read them out. So first off, uh, my story, who, who I am. Uh, just to give you a bit more background as to who I am, in case you're wondering why I'm here giving you a DNI talk, uh, I'm a gay man, um, very recently engaged actually. I grew up in Pembroke in Southwest Wales uh, in a very, very, very small village uh, with my parents and my three brothers. Uh, it's a very nice area of Wales, beautiful beaches, uh, but not too much uh, in the way of LGBTQ plus community. Uh, to call the phrase uh, that you often hear, uh, you know, at times I felt like the only gay in the village. It was always very different to my brothers as well. I was never into sports, uh, and said I loved musicals and dancing. Uh, I was always more effeminate in the way I spoke or stood or dressed. Um, that said, for a long, long time, I tried to hide those attributes growing up. Uh, it felt like something I needed to hide, you know, particularly in school where you feel that you'll get picked on for these things. Uh, I therefore only came out when I was 21, after I did a year studying abroad in Australia. Uh, by that point, I had, you know, pretty much got fed up, <laughs> basically with pretending to be someone uh, that I wasn't and being abroad somewhere when no one knew me and where my family was on the other side of the world uh, kind of gave me a good chance to reset and come out and be myself. Of course, I then had to come back from Australia um, and I very quickly came out to my family. I, I made the decision then that I wasn't going to pretend to be something I wasn't again having come out in Australia. It was such a relief, so I didn't want to go back to my former life of pretending that I wasn't gay. Um, and so now I'm pretty much happily out. Um, I'm very involved in our community. I'm part of the London Gay Men's Chorus, as you'll see from the picture. Um, I am part of my firm's LGBT network. Uh, I regularly go out, regularly go to queer events. Um, so I'm very much you know, happy and proud where I am now. So turning to what being your authentic self means. Um, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of a buzzword uh, that you'll hear chucked around uh, HR and DNI events. I like to think of it in terms of the meaning it's commonly given, uh, which is being real or genuine. Uh, so in my mind, you can probably move the authentic part and just say it's about being yourself. Uh, in practice, what being authentic is will look different for each person. For me, that's slightly campy, effeminate, loving musicals and dance, uh, but that will be different for each person. And for you, it's hard to give anyone tips, therefore, on how you should be authentic. I think the biggest sign will be whether you feel you're hiding anything at work, or if in actuality you feel like you're just being yourself, much you are with your friends or at home. So what are some of the benefits of being authentic at work? 
Now, Harvard did a study uh, asking people what the benefits of being authentic at work were in the eyes of both employees and those in senior management. And the points on the slide were all points that they found. So taking these in turn a bit more to give my view on them, uh, better relationships with colleagues. I think that if you are hiding part of yourself at work, it is harder for people to engage with you uh, and reveal you for sure and to warm to you and get to know you. Now, you're still not going to get on with everybody at work, uh, but I think you will make more meaningful relationships uh, with people. So secondly, they've got high levels of trust. It's really connected to the above. If you are hiding part of yourself at work, this is usually something that people will pick up on, uh, which will usually lead to them feeling some form of tension and distrusting you. You know, it is really remarkable how well people at work can read and pick up on your emotions. You don't realize it, but they do. So third day, we've got greater productivity. If you are spending time worrying about how you're perceived or working on how to hide who you are, then it's going to start taking away from your focus and getting work done. And then I'll take the next two together, more positive working environment and being happier at work. Uh, these are personal things uh, in a sense that you will feel more comfortable at work because you're being yourself. And then finally, we've got more self-awareness. And that actually came from senior management uh, who were interviewed as part of the Harvard study, uh, whereby they felt those who are more authentic at work are actually more self-aware of their strengths and weaknesses. Now, just to touch on why I personally decided to be authentic at work. Uh, so as I told you, I spent a lot of my time growing up hiding who I was, uh, trying to change aspects of myself. And to be honest, it, it made me pretty miserable. Uh, it's not a good place to be in. So having done that for 21 years, I never wanted to put myself through that again. Uh, so I wanted to come into work, be myself, be who I am, and not have to worry and spend time trying to cover up parts of myself. Um, I didn't really necessarily come out at work. Um, I've always just sort of dropped it into conversation. You know, if somebody asks you what you got up to at the weekend, I will usually be pretty open and honest uh, that, you know, my boyfriend and I went and saw a musical. So it's, it's not that I've ever made a spectacle of coming out at work. Um, it's kind of just part of myself. And that's how I've always treated it. Let's move on. Now, just touch on some of the negatives to being authentic in the workplace uh, that people commonly think coming out will be themselves uh, will attract and challenging those based off my experience. Uh, I couldn't really resist a, a Mean Girls picture. I love the movie uh, and I think it ties in well for the first point, so forgive me. Uh, so yeah, the first point there, we've got people will gossip about me. I think there are two aspects to this. Um, you're not going to tell everybody stuff that went on in your life 24 seven. Um, you will build up the trust with them. You will get to know them. You will have a sense as to the people you can tell more personal stuff in the workplace and the people who you can be yourself with, but you're not going to tell them everything. Um, so yeah, be careful who you tell them, what you tell them. Basically, um, it, it is a work environment. Uh, people at work do like to gossip not, you know, about many things. Um, so yeah, it's more about you will get a sense of who you trust and what you can tell them. And to be honest, if someone does abuse your trust and starts gossiping about something you've told them and going around telling other people, I think that's really more on them because you've told them something personal because you've come to trust them and then they've, they've gone and broken that trust. So the second one there is damaging your job and promotion prospects. Uh, this is actually one that resonates with me a lot because when I initially came out, my parents, whilst not having that awful reaction, gave me the line that they thought it would be difficult for me to enter the legal profession and to pro progress in the legal profession, uh, which is honestly completely and utterly <laughs> untrue. Uh, if anything, good leaders value honesty and trust more than you fitting in with a certain image. After all, everyone is human, everyone is individual, everyone has emotions. Um, and if anything these days, I think B 
being yourself, being out helps you, if anything. You know, people will, will see that and they will respect that and they will they will see you as a role model to people. And then thirdly, uh, people commonly say, you know, if if I'm out, if I'm too focused on being myself at work, it will take away from my work. Uh, so I think actually working on yourself and being more confident in being yourself is a far better investment of your time. At the end of the day, work is work. We all do it because we all need money, uh, but you only have one life and you've got to invest in yourself it's something my other half says a lot you, you know it's more worth while spending money and time getting yourself in a position that you're happy and comfortable uh, so i think that is more amiable than anything uh, and that pretty much wraps up the slides i wanted to run through um, i know that's very high level uh, so we're going to move on to a Q&A section. If anybody does have any questions, please be far away. Hi, right, Lewis. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've we've had. Um, we we'll just give give some opportunity for people watching to ask questions. Um, we've had a couple in already, um, but yeah, I just wanted to pick up on some things that really resonated with me on what you were talking about. And, you know, very similar situation but congratulations on your recent engagement that thank you <laughs> that is a first as we know um equal marriage only came into the uk in 2014 so not that long ago so actually to be able to hear these key milestones and people live in these key milestones on events like this um is so important um you you mentioned uh within your organization and i know you've got such an incredible name for it but you mentioned the lgbt uh, plus network group. So just wondering whether you could talk a little bit more about that and, you know, maybe some of the projects you've got involved in and did that help you become that sort of live your authentic self because you could see other people like you represented in your organization? Yeah, no problem. Uh, so yeah, we have an LGBTQ plus network uh, that is cleverly called Pride & Co. Um, quite sassy, uh, I know. I didn't come up with that though. Um, and we do a lot of stuff. We've looked at uh, gender neutral toilets in the workplace. We've looked at how you should refer to somebody uh, who's non binary and trans and come up with wordings around that. We've looked at our works policies in terms of adoption leave. Obviously, uh, same-sex couples, uh, it's not that easy. Um, so adoption is actually one of the main routes open to you. And so we've been working on making sure that actually you still get a good amount of time uh, where you're adopting off work uh, so that you can focus on integrating the child you've adopted into your family. Um, I think LGBTQ plus networks are definitely important to have in a workplace. Um, both from a level of, as I say, pushing forward policy and Chris, as you mentioned, uh, it's good to have role models and be able to see people in your organization who are out. Um, you attend so many talks where somebody said, oh, you know, I didn't necessarily think there was any other gays or lesbians, et cetera, in the organization. But when you have a network, you realize there are so many more. Um, I think it's just people often feel you know they get too wrapped up in work um so it does help to have these networks because it gives you the visibility mm, absolutely and if someone was to join pride and co so one of the questions that we've actually had is um you know uh are there lots of people out at Clyde and co so i guess i'd like to find out sort of how big is that network um and what do you do like if if someone was to join Clyde and Co and they say right I'm going to join Pride and Co as a network what type of things could they be expecting to get involved in or the types of people that they could be you know working with um across that network yeah no problem um so in terms of the size of the network um it is a global network um so it was started up by London uh but our people in our Manchester office, people in our Glasgow office join in. We've got people in our American offices who join in. Uh, there's people in our Australian offices who are trying to join in, time zone permitting, uh, people in Canada. Uh, so pretty much it's a global network. Um, there's a lot of people 
in the network, uh, which is comforting to see. Uh, you know, they don't necessarily all turn up to the meetings. As I say, time zones make it very difficult uh, for people a lot of the time, um, but it is a very active and large network. Um, if somebody was to join, um, the first thing I should say is as a new joiner, they usually give you an introduction to the DNI networks the firm has, um, of which you'll, you'll get an introduction to Pride & Co. Uh, if somebody joins, you know, the meetings usually, as I say, we look at some policy stuff, we look at events, um, and usually the meetings are attended by people from partners, the head of DNI, down to, you know, paralegals, trainees, secretaries, you know, the meetings are very much open to everybody. Um, there's, in that sense, you know, there's no real committee running the show. It is more like a, everyone can join in the meetings, everyone can put forward ideas, everyone can contribute. Well, I think you often find with, with networks like this, you have such a variety of colleagues. So just mention, you know, right from partners, um, right through to associates, it really is a mixture um, of everyone. Um, Okay, we've had quite a few more questions come in. Are you still with us? Your screen, I can't see you anymore, but I can see that you're still there. Yep, I yep. am still. Okay, now someone said, Mark submitted a question. You mentioned you're with your partner, but if you weren't with a partner, have you got any tips on things you do to drop the conversation into, uh, to drop the conversation with colleagues? Yep. Um... I've always been fairly upfront, you know, if anybody asked me, you know, what did you get up to yesterday evening? So as I mentioned, I'm part of the London Gay Men's Chorus. I'll mention, you know, oh, I went to rehearsal for this chorus I'm in and they'll usually ask, oh, what chorus? And I'm like, oh, the London Gay Men's Chorus, we rehearse up in Camden. Um, or usually drop it in if somebody asks me what I did at the weekend fact is I usually go gay clubbing so I'll mention oh I went to such and such club and you know that's usually enough of an indication um are you still with us yep yeah so okay so your tips is, is basically don't sort of hide where, where you're going and what you're doing um it's yeah. a good way if you say yeah I'm going you know I went for a drink in heaven, for example, just taking that as an yeah. example in London. I, yeah, it may, it may spur that conversation on. Um, yeah, it's it's not like, I mean, these are things you actually did. All you're doing is talking about stuff you actually did in your life. I mean, just like one of my straight colleagues would tell me at the weekend that they went to the cinema or they went to Infernos in Clapham on a night out. Um, it's just having a normal conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, like Mark, I would just add on to that, that, you know, our partner, I think quite rightly, has has gathered a lot more um, traction. You know, people do tend to say, now, do you have a partner rather than do you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, for example. But if you are talking to someone and they misgender your your partner or they or they assume then that you are straight and not LGBT, then correct them. You know, because absolutely, if you correct them at the start, then you're going to sort of lay that foundation to say, no, I, you know, don't identify like that. Or actually, I went on a date with a man instead of a woman, a woman instead of a man, for example. I would I would definitely take that opportunity to correct them there or then, because it's quite easy to then quickly get into a web <laughs> where if you don't correct them straight away. Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, someone's mentioned, how do you think you can be authentic through the recruitment process? Um, good question. Uh, I think hopefully it will come across from your answers being real, um, especially, I mean, come interview stage, if you've put down a bunch of stuff that isn't real and authentic, people are going to pick up on it pretty quickly. Um, so as long as you're giving answers that are real and true to what you think and how you feel in terms of stuff like putting down on recruitment forms, your sexuality, gender, et cetera. Uh, I think most firms do ask for it. I know law firms particularly, they will always ask for it more from like a data perspective, uh, less in terms of anyone's really gonna look at that because I think that data doesn't then get passed on to people who are making the recruitment decisions, uh, at least in the law firm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and on a point where if you know if if you go through the recruitment process and someone does ask personal details, this doesn't follow you with your application. Your application goes one way, your um, protected characteristic data goes the other, and it's a way for organisations to see well, actually, are we attracting um, a diverse mix of individuals? And if that answer is no, then organisations can then do some work to understand well why is that. Uh, also. We all completed the ONS um, census data uh, beginning of this end of last year, beginning of this year. Well, I think that will be really telling because the data that we've got at the moment is 10 years old. And for the first time, they did introduce um, sexual orientation. So for the first time in 2021, uh, we asked that information. And in 2022, 2023, we will be able to actually measure, OK, what does the population of the UK look like when it comes to sexual orientation, which is so exciting because it means organisations then can actually make sure that they are reflective of the society and the community um, that they serve. OK, plenty of questions coming in, uh, Lewis. So actually, could you stop sharing your screen and then we yep. bring your camera back on? Thank you. Um Okay, so do you think attending Insights event is is as important as your application process? In attending in Insight events, yeah. So events like this today, is it is is it important for your application process? Um, I would say so. Less in the sense of putting down that you've done the Insight day, more in the sense of this is a good opportunity for you to get a feel for the firms, what they do, what the people are like, what their culture is like. So I'd say it's less about listing that you've been to all of these insight days. It's more about using the days usefully to get the information you want and getting a feel for the firm. Because it works both ways. I mean, it's not only a company is looking for you, you're looking for the right company for you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um... Days like today in particular, and I'll cover it sort of in my next section, sort of top tips from today, but today is all about understanding, okay, what, what have organisations got on offer? Um, is it a right fit for you? And I think particularly looking at the LGBTQ plus community, you know, we do want to see ourselves reflected in positions of privilege within organisations. So when you can attend today, uh, days like today, it means that you can you can really sort of ask those questions and, and find out a bit more about the culture um, before you dive in and before you apply. OK, one of the um, questions here, which I think would be great to hear from you. Um, so you mentioned some of the work you've been doing at, at Pride & Co, like sort of looking at gender neutral toilets, facilities, that type of thing. Um, but what was your most interesting uh, project that you got involved in? Ooh, the most interesting one is probably the adoption leave one uh, my partner and i have always been very open that we went into this we want kids um and we've discussed it adoption is actually probably for us what we would do you know there's enough unloved kids in the world uh why go through a whole process let's adopt um so that one meant a lot to me because obviously I'm going to be benefiting it from it personally. Um, and I think it's quite a good thing. It's quite a shocking thing that some firms don't have a sort of equal adoption policy because um, it really does put you at a bit more of a disadvantage. If anything, when you adopt, I think you probably need that time to you know, sort of assimilate them into your family and get to know them and get comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it sounds like an incredible thing to get involved in. And I know... Many organisations take on uh, pro bono work um, to support underrepresented communities, the LGBT one being one of them. Um, I'm going to finish up with two final questions. So we've had a number of similar questions saying, what are the main qualities that you look for within applications? Um, and like, what's the ideal candidate? So appreciate um, these questions can, can be covered on the employee booth. Um, but did you want to provide some insights into what Clyde & Co are looking for from ideal applications and candidates? Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there's probably somebody in, in the employment booth who can give you a, a better answer. Um, I would say Clyde's are looking for a genuine interest in the firm. So this probably relates back to your answers being real and authentic. Um, I think firms can read through the lines. If you're 
not actually interested in what the firm does, uh, who we are, that will come across. Um, so having an actual interest in the work we do um, will help. Um, other things, um, I think, as I say, it's not so much about putting down that you've been on these insight days, but showing that you've been to these insight days and you feel like the firm is a good fit. Again, I think that's more about it'll, it'll come through in your answers, um, whether you really do feel passionate about the firm. Um, Clyde's do have, as most law firms do, requirements around uh, grades, etc. But they are not the be-all and end-all. They're actually balanced out with your answers as well. So if you don't quite meet the grades, I think usually if your answers are showing a passion for the firm and an interest, uh, that will be taken into account. Okay, thank you. And the variety of opportunities available, it, it's not just within the legal sector, it's not just you have to study law in order to, to have a career at, within a legal firm, right? So do you want to just maybe pick up on some of the opportunities that's available um, outside of the sort of traditional, yes, you study law to then work within that field? Yeah, no problem. Um, definitely. I mean, law firms these days, are, if anything, as much looking for people who do non-law um, as who do law, um, not having done law is in by, by no means a bar to working in, going into the legal profession. Uh, what they're looking for is transferable skills that you can bring to the table from whatever you've done. If you've got languages, law firms love that. Um, English, stuff like that. It's all, you know, that helps you with drafting. Um, so by means don't have to do law also you don't have to actually go and do a degree there's ways into law firms like the uh legal executive route where you buy you actually are getting more experience within the firm less studying uh, it's a slightly longer route but it is if you would prefer to sort of get started on the work it that is one of the routes in well thank you and i'd finish up with one final question um so if you could turn back time, share reference, <laughs> what would be a piece of advice you would give yourself um, when you were younger? Uh, probably tell myself to come out earlier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I mean, I came out when I was 21. It was quite a while on. And for, you know, it made school quite a negative experience for me. So I think I would tell myself to have the confidence and know that now I'm very much happy and once I do it actually be like a massive weight off my shoulders so I probably would have advised myself to come out earlier and yeah okay bro thank you so much well if you want to hear more about Clyde & Co then you can visit the employer booths um, I will be back on the stage at one o'clock where I'm going to share with you some tips some ideas on how to make the most out of today as we hear from uh, speakers later on in the afternoon. Uh, so please start thinking of questions for me. Um, but Lewis, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time with us, um, for sharing your personal journey um, and for sharing insights. I know the members here today appreciate it. We've already had comments saying you've got such good initiatives. It's amazing to see uh, employers like yours are tackling these issues. So thank you so much. And um, everyone, I will see you back at one o'clock. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.